uh, the Confucius Institute and uh, all the colleagues in uh, Lithuania who were very welcoming to me and were very eager to learn more about the Ukrainian museums and the Asian collections in Ukraine. And uh, this is the first lecture uh, with a little bit of a provocative um, name, uh, but still um, we are not only talking about art, we also talk about personalities and there are lots of different personalities who um, uh, made their huge um, impact on the development of uh, the art process and collecting art objects and present, uh, presenting art objects to the audience of Ukraine over the years and in the very harsh times. So I would rather uh, start uh, now, I would just uh, like role play when I'm here in Latvia. Uh, I would uh, imagine that I'm uh, in my, uh, uh, in my museum back in Ukraine, and I would ask Vilma to switch to the first slide. <laughs> <laughs> so we are like uh, in the big hall of um, the Chinese art in the uh, Hanyanka Museum that has both European, or as we used to call it, Western part, and the Asian or the Eastern part. So we are in the Asian part, in the Asian collection, and we are in a hall of the Chinese art. Uh, that is the second from the beginning, like I would introduce you to, to the museum or give you a guided tour. And I would uh, prompt you that like, okay, now we will be overloaded with the Buddhist uh, wisdom. Then we'll go to some more moderate um, uh, content and then we'll relax in the Japanese hall where then there are Netsuke, where are those uh, cute uh, uh, woodlock prints and cuteness overload. So the Chinese hall is somewhere in the middle, in the middle of uh, sophisticated ideas and the ideas like not, not actually the ideas but very simple things to enjoy, to contemplate, uh, to look at. Uh, so uh, th this is how the hall looks like now. And uh, you'll see there are there is plenty of ceramics. There are vases right in front of the hall, uh, in, the, in the middle of the hall. And on the walls, there are um, some cases with uh, paintings and well, lots of porcelain as well. Uh, so. Uh, like uh, when we talk about the uh, um, museum founders and we, we start with it, it was founded by the couple of uh, Bogdan and Varvara Khanenka, we'll see them soon. Uh, like um, the things that they uh, that used to belong to the Khanenka couple, the, the founders are quite, quite a few in this hall. Uh, so, uh, you can, uh, would you please switch to the second slide mm -hmm. and you will see uh, the area picture of uh, the museum when it was already established at the State Museum. Uh, and uh, that was uh, in the uh, 1920s uh, when Hanenko themselves could not like uh, much influence how, uh, how the museum would arrange uh, uh, stuff uh, in, in this space, how, how would you represent the things. Uh, like I've already told you um, uh, that uh, this picture from the 1920s is quite rare and there are no uh, pictures of the museum uh, or the private collection as it was uh, before uh, 1919 has survived, but uh, I'll go to that uh, in detail um, I'd, I'd rather start uh, with the uh, museum founders. Uh, so uh, I hope you see the two portraits now. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so as you can see from the uh, years of uh, uh, of their uh, the lives of these two people, they were um, like. Uh, 
the, the children of the 19th century. And um, they were part of um, uh, the Beaumont, the uh, developing uh, city of Kiev. Uh, and uh, the husband, uh, Bogdan Khanenko, was a lawyer. And uh, they both, uh, the, the wife and the husband, they came from wealthy families and uh, they had uh, both some bourgeois, uh, bourgeoisie and some no nobility in their ancestors, uh, among their ancestors. So uh, these like children of the 19th century were looking forward to the changes of the whole society at the edge of uh, the centuries and uh, when they were quite young and um, uh, when they just traveled for their honeymoon in Italy they uh, became obsessed with the uh, with Italian antiquities and like uh, but soon uh, they came to an idea to create a museum of world cultures uh, to donate it or at least to first to open it to the whole city to the community of the city uh, so everyone could be in touch with the masterpieces from all cultures, all times. And they started uh, collecting art pieces for the sake of the future museum. Even if they, they did, didn't call it a museum, uh, they still um, kept in mind the uh, idea of a museum. And uh, they started co collecting uh, like a big variety of things from uh, Ukrainian icons and Russian icons, uh, embroidery and uh, decorative items like glass and porcelain um, of uh, various uh, various uh, periods of time, various countries. Uh, then uh, Bogdan became uh, interested in uh, mostly in uh, the European art and world art. So he ha also had uh, Japanese uh, tsuba uh, collection. He, he had swords. He had uh, um, uh, like a multitude of things uh, from other cultures. And Barbara Khanenko was mostly focusing on uh, collecting uh, Ukrainian art uh, and religious art, like icons, uh, like. Um, uh, priest garments and uh, all kinds of embroideries and uh, folk art. Uh, so, um, uh, in uh, I'm sorry, just a second, I'll try to change the slide. Uh, so, uh, first they were focused like anyone in the uh, in the uh, times. They were focused on uh, European. Uh, vector of like development uh, in art, in everything. And uh, they also needed some exotic items. Uh, and although Bogdan Khanenko participated in, uh, 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 in war uh, between Japan and uh, Russia, Russian Empire uh, in 1905, 1906, uh, he was a Red Cross, uh, like he, he participated in not, not only war actually, but uh, as a representative of a Red Cross. Uh, but uh, still he was like um, reluctant to get uh, uh, some objects directly from the cultures he was interested in. He needed like a kind of uh, European mediation uh, between the uh, Far Eastern uh, uh, Asian cultures and uh, himself, like uh, he uh, he relied on uh, French, mostly French experts, uh, to introduce him to uh, Asian art. And uh, what happened uh, just uh, before uh, World War, of, uh, the, the First World War, is that he uh, bought. Uh, these two, I, I think uh, you can see this now, the, the slide had changed. Uh, so he's, uh, he has bought uh, two uh, scrolls of Chinese paintings. Uh, I'm sorry, these do not uh, give justice to, <laughs> uh, to the pictures, um, but they, uh, these are really like masterpieces. 
uh, he bought it uh, from the uh, Georges Petit uh, auction house uh, in a gallery of Georges Petit, who was f um, famous for uh, being a president of Chamber of Art Experts in Paris. And he held that um, uh, lots of events related to art, to the art that was contemporary to his uh, time and to and uh, for um, events for antiquities. Um, so uh, he, uh, so Hanenka, uh, Bogdan Hanenka uh, bought these two uh, paintings out of eight that were presented there in the gallery. And uh, that was in May, like these days, but in 1914, uh, about like uh, 7th to 9th May, uh, 1914 in Paris. And uh, those um, artworks were attributed uh, to like Ming Dynasty, so like perhaps 15th to 16th century. And um, it is not sure who was the expert, the, persona the very personality of the expert you know, who gave this attribution to the uh, paintings. Uh, but there must be some con consultants who could uh, read Chinese, who um, had some knowledge of Chinese and Chinese art. So um, I assume that those could be uh, some um, uh, Chinese Catholics uh, who were uh, like part of the uh, French community. Uh, there was fr um, French inf uh, influencers, uh, Jesuits uh, who came to China to like <laughs> spread the word about Christ and then became like uh, quite a big force in uh, like influencing Chinese politics. Uh, you know, that's a separate subject. Uh, so uh, there could be much more people uh, involved in this process, in the process of acquisition and the process of introducing uh, these uh, artworks. Uh, and eventually, uh, I, I'm not uh, really sure uh, uh, wh why did Hanenka chosen these two things. Uh, like what was his motivation, but still, um, I'm not sure because we have no, unfortunately we have no, uh, nothing of his of archive has survived until now. We have no uh, decent notes and uh, it is said that uh, his widow, uh, not, not actually only the widow, but one of the museum founders, Varvara, his post Varvara, uh, he, uh, she, uh, there is a legend that she burned his uh, diaries and his notes on uh, his acquisitions. And so we can uh, just assume that uh, he was already fascinated with the um, quality of works. And he also was kind of aware of uh, the genres of uh, Chinese paintings uh, that uh, so he, he had chosen a, a landscape with some persons in it that like we can um, uh, uh, give this a name of Jean Wu Hua. So the depiction of characters of personalities and the famous uh, Chinese genre of uh, Hua Niao, uh, which is the bird and flower painting. Uh, the, uh, that, uh, like these peonies on a rock, I, I think I will, uh, give uh, them more attention uh, in my next lecture. Uh, so while we are like, um, uh, um, I was a bit uh, um, uh, focusing on, uh, on these two things too much perhaps, uh, but still uh, we also know uh, that at the same time, uh, Hanenka uh, bought some uh, other items of Chinese art Mm, we are not sure if uh, that was from the same uh, auction house because um, we haven't found uh, that there are any like um, listings uh, with the say the drum uh, or the Hang uh, Dynasty drum 
or any bronzes. Uh, so uh, we assume that he bought them from uh, the antiquity dealers in Paris in more or less the same time as he bought those um, Chinese paintings. It, it is more like the, um, we, we have uh, more data on the paintings and less on bronzes. And uh, there were also uh, uh, like um, lots of porcelain, uh, presumably also from the French collectors, uh, from French antiquity dealers. And uh, uh, like, let's pretend that I'm walking you around the Chinese hall. Uh, so these are uh, lots of other objects uh, that used to belong to Hanenka, uh, used to be, uh, some of them used to belong to um, other collectors uh, that eventually ended up uh, in our museum. Uh, talking about the couple of Hanenka, um, uh, just I, I have to emphasize that uh, Bogdan Hanenka, uh, he died of na like natural causes. There were no um, like, uh, 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 that was before the uh, October Revolution, uh, that was just uh, in times of calamities, but uh, not, not the harshest times. Uh, but his widow, Varvara, she survived until uh, 1923, and we were like about to uh, commemorate her uh, life, uh, her like... Uh, mm, uh, we're about to um, prepare the, the big ex uh, exhibition of uh, about her uh, life. Uh, we started the preparations and now we are like on a big pause. Um, she, uh, and what we want to, uh, to go back when we uh, have a, a possibility to go back to commemorating her as she deserves, uh, we would like to emphasize that she was the person who turned the private collection into a state-run museum. And uh, that was a big, um, uh, like a big, really hero, like a, almost a heroic deed on her part uh, because she was proposed to immigrate. She was proposed to uh, like evacuate the collection uh, abroad. Uh, when the Bolsheviks uh, eventually took over Kiev, there were plenty of uh, uh, changes of um, power in the city. Like uh, there was a month, like uh, the, the, the power has changed th three times. And uh, among all those calamities, she uh, used all her soft skills, all her uh, previous friendships, her new acquaintances, uh, to convince people on the quality and quantity and the um, uh, big importance of the collection to the to the city, and uh, there were by uh, by Bahadur's death, uh, there was his testament uh, that stated that um, he donates uh, the uh, I uh, it said like I donate this uh, collection. Uh, along with the library to the city of Kiev, um, uh, but I uh, I demand it to be uh, unseparated. So um, his will was to keep everything, like both Ukrainian and uh, European and Asian art, all together as the comprehensive collection, along with the library. So it had to be belong to the city, and his will, unfortunately, was not. Uh, put into practice because the uh, the uh, situations changed dr dramatically quite a few times. And first, Varvara started uh, negotiating um, with the uh, newly newly established Ukrainian Academy of um, Sciences. Uh, it was uh, the initiative of the young Ukrainian Republic, like. The Nationalist Republic, if you if you'd like to to call it so, uh, but when uh, the Bolsheviks came, uh, she eventually made it to uh, uh, like to get a kind of a mandate that uh, prohibited any uh, 
like use of the premises, any use of the house that they built for the collection. Um, uh, to, to use it uh, on any other pretext for any other purpose than to keep the collection. Uh, and uh, from that uh, time in uh, June 1919, uh, we, we start uh, like the history of our museum as a state-run museum. Uh, although it, uh, it, runs, uh, it, it needed some time, it took some time to uh, establish the museum to to reopen it like to open it to public and it started functioning in the 1920s so here is uh, this rare picture of uh, of the one of the interiors and uh, we see the chinese bronzes here on the table uh, the table is covered with a persian drug and there are uh, cheers, uh, some of them are from uh, Spain, some are from Russia. Uh, so, uh, and overall, uh, like to the extent the museum workers in uh, 1920s uh, believed, it reflected uh, the uh, period of Middle Ages everywhere. Uh, so, uh, going back to the uh, big uh, collection of uh, other um, decorative objects. And uh, you see here the uh, ivory carving, the uh, uh, different kinds of jade carving, like there is uh, almost white jade and here uh, is a almost translucent uh, jade carving and these darker uh, items were the copies of uh, ancient bronzes uh, carved in uh, darker jade uh, and that uh, glass item in the shape of a magnolia leaf. So these are uh, multiple uh, acquisitions and some of them come from the collection of Jaspar. And along with uh, the garments, um, and, uh, so you can see the fragment here uh, and uh, we, had um, removed uh, most of the garments from the collections uh, from the Chinese hall right now. Uh, but well, we hope that uh, after some uh, conserv conservative measures and uh, after the war, war is over, so we can get back to more to um, all those um, uh, decorative items, uh, embroidery uh, items, garments. Uh, but now, uh, lots of things uh, from the collection of these two people, uh, they need uh, lots of um, conservation and restoration measures. Uh, so now, uh, before we go back to the subjects and um, to, to the uh, things themselves, the artworks, um, here is uh, another story of another couple, of a very different couple. Uh, I can give you a link later on um, to, so you can read uh, an article in Russian, uh, and it is written by a very serious journalist uh, who, like, <laughs> I'm, I'm grateful to him that um, eventually he had um, uh, taken some load uh, that I had to carry. Uh, I, I'll explain in what, uh, what, what do I mean. Uh, so, um, uh, the collection Jaspar, the Jaspar collection. Uh, this, uh, like a huge collection of uh, embroidery garments, decorative items, some sculpture, uh, and like uh, was given to the museum uh, via the Soviet uh, Ministry of Culture and their uh, so-called Board of Panoramas and uh, Exhibitions uh, in May uh, 1959, and then in, um, in November 1959. Uh, and uh, as soon as it like entered the museum, it started a kind of a legend. 
uh, the legend loaded with uh, lots of um, assumptions, uh, gossips, and like. Uh, why was it so? Uh, like uh, uh, when the museum uh, survived uh, the Second World War, uh, lost a little bit uh, of its collection uh, of uh, Chinese art, mostly ceramics. Uh, those um, like two paintings uh, bought by Hanyanka, they were intact and lots of other things were intact. Uh, and we also got some, uh, some separate items from one source or another. So uh, this time uh, the museum became more like a, a regular um, art gallery uh, along any other museum. Uh, whatever could be there, uh, like uh, uh, perhaps rank in the whole ex-Soviet Union uh, museum, like hierarchy or like uh, whatever you know, the founders could uh, think of. Uh, that was a kind of a museum that school children were taken to, like uh, workers from factories were given the almost <laughs> uh, like um, uh, obligatory uh, guided tours they had to visit and like. Uh, so at that time, uh, the uh, art lovers uh, could just like enjoy the view of what uh, was uh, uh, left after the uh, Bolsheviks took, took uh, uh, some items uh, to the um, exhibitions in 1933, uh, in 1936, uh, and didn't uh, get uh, put back and right until now. Uh, then there were Nazis who looted the museum uh, then some items were left uh, in uh, some behind, somewhere behind Ural Mountains and never went back. So uh, in such uh, like, uh, not, not uh, so, so, so the collection of the museum uh, has lost lots of uh, things. And also uh, I've forgotten to mention that uh, the Ukrainian art and the uh, uh, some uh, Russian icons, uh, those were separate, separately uh, moved to uh, other museums within Kyiv. Uh, so uh, they were kept uh, in Ukraine in Kyiv, but still um, they, didn't, uh, they were not on display in Hanyanka Museum anymore. And by, uh, by that time, the Hanyanka Museum was not Hanyanka Museum, it was uh, the uh, Museum for uh, Eastern and Western Art. The Asian, uh, Asian and European art. Uh, so um, at that time, in uh, the uh, la late uh, 1950s, uh, there was a big pressure on the museum workers to uh, somehow modernize the exhibition uh, to show the um, art of like. Uh, nations that were supposed to be brothers, Bratskia Narode. And among those brothers, there were uh, Middle Asian republics of the Soviet Union, like uh, Uzbekistan and uh, uh, Turkmenia. And there were also, uh, there, there was a big pressure to show the art of emerging Chinese Republic, People's uh, Republic of China. Uh, so uh, when the uh, when Taisia Jaspar arrived in Kiev, uh, it was just she was just in time with the collection uh, that she and her husband collected in Shanghai, uh, starting approximately in 1928, and then uh, like um, until uh, 1944 or like. Uh, when they moved, uh, like uh, they, they stayed uh, during the Second World War in Shanghai, uh, but uh, we, uh, we, we can hardly find anything that they um, acquired after like uh, 
1938. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, actually the couple moved to Paris in early 1950s. Um, and uh, uh, after they separated, uh, Taisia Jaspar went to live in Kiev. She was very eager to uh, to live in the Soviet Union, to, to in the new Russia, as she uh, imagined that, because she was of the uh, uh, Russian uh, descent of, uh, she was born, uh, as you see, in 1912, uh, but um, she mostly grew up uh, in, uh, um, in the Far East. Uh, she was uh, like quite, um, Romantic, she was romanticizing all the life in uh, the Soviet Union. Perhaps she was uh, bored or somehow like tired uh, of uh, living in either um, uh, China or France that were not uh, her, like <laughs> the, the countries she was not. Uh, uh, understanding as her like roots, her heritage. So she wanted to live in, like say, Russia. Uh, she, eventually she ended up living in Kyiv. And after uh, she separated from her husband, who, who was uh, a very uh, uh, high rank uh, diplomat, French diplomat. Um, and it was also said like he was, uh, uh, a relative of Charles de Gaulle and um, uh, lots of other, like uh, she, she uh, was a very influential uh, personality in the whole politics, uh, in whole French politics in the Far East. Um, and she like um, uh, tried to separate from that and she, she tried to start a new life and uh, uh, it, it is also said that uh, uh, while Jaspar was uh, alive, uh, he didn't mind uh, that his wife, his separated wife, uh, would give uh, their uh, collection to the uh, people of the Soviet Union. Uh, so eventually when she did that uh, three years after his, de his death, uh, there were no questions on the French part. There, there were no questions um, on the Jap uh, on uh, sorry on uh, the Chinese part. How come that uh, like uh, three hundred and fifty scrolls of the Chinese paintings and uh, like uh, hundred of items of embroidery and clothes and uh, uh, lots of objects of uh, jade and uh, ivory carving ended up in a Soviet museum. Uh, it was all clear, it was all, all like uh, uh, absolutely okay with everybody, with all parts. Uh, but then it started rumors within uh, the city of Kyiv because uh, behind the Iron Curtain, uh, you can imagine a person arriving from uh, Far East, uh, the person who had uh, close ties with uh, the most influential people uh, uh, in um, in Shanghai uh, who had ties with uh, white Russian uh, immigration, Bela Migracia. Uh, so um, she was like a magnet for everybody, for people to gossip, for um, the Soviet uh, security to like to follow her in any of her steps. Uh, and eventually, um, uh, like I've mentioned that article on her biography, uh, like she was uh, eventually became a KGB agent. And the um, journalist who wrote the first article, uh, he was about to follow up uh, on that and, and produce a second article. Um, and he was like very happy to inform me that well I found the <laughs> uh, the uh, some uh, files about her in the archives. Uh, uh, the archive was related to another Ukrainian uh, painter uh, who was uh, in uh, KGB and uh, uh, at that time uh, agent. 
And well, <laughs> I said, okay, thank you. <laughs> and now at least you, you are responsible for uh, giving people all the, that information that they were so eager to get. Who was that lady? Why did she? Why did she uh, donate to this city such a huge gift of uh, Chinese paint, Chinese art? Um, uh, like, uh, are, are these things uh, like? Uh, uh, was that legal or not to give that? <laughs> so <laughs> now this uh, huge. Um, amount of questions is resolved and without my, <laughs> my efforts. Uh, so I'm happy about that. And I can talk about art eventually, not about the, the person. But what I, am, uh, I, what I would like to emphasize, um, like I've been living uh, with all those questions and like I start uh, like an exhibition and write uh, something like this uh, painting of birds and flowers, uh, such and such number, uh, the technique dimensions like, and then it, um, it comes from the Jaspar collection. And the people are like, oh, oh, why did she, uh, why, why did she, uh, like, why did she donate that? Uh, was it all uh, like um, were all those uh, items uh, like uh, real or fakes? Um, like why do you reveal all that only now? And uh, along with that, like I am um, not a historian of that epoch, and I cannot assume a lot about the personality, uh, but. Uh, what, uh, what I would like to emphasize about the personality of uh, Thais Jaspar as a, like a person, um, I'm, like, I'm grateful uh, that she had given us such a big gift, not only a gift, but she also uh, of all those uh, 350 like items she uh, sold. Uh, about uh, 150 and the other part of this big collection was given as a gift. Uh, so that was not only her like uh, gift, but also <laughs> a nice business. Um, but uh, I'm, uh, when I'm uh, asked about like personalities and motivations, Mm, I cannot speak on the behalf of a person whom I have never met, <laughs> who actually died when I was a kid. Mm, but I'm grateful that she had uh, given all that to our city, to our collection, so we can research, we can um, explain lots of things like just illustrating um, um, our ideas, our like general the uh, theoretical knowledge of the Chinese art, just presenting the works from her collection, their collection, the Jaspar collection. Um, she has never done any research on the things she given she has given to the museum. Um, many of the items were given uh, like really strange attributions. Uh, they were attributed to the um, like great artists of the uh, Chinese art. Uh, like meanwhile, uh, there are like about uh, like a dozen of uh, pieces that have uh, that are, have real uh, like provenance that, that belong to the authors that were claimed. Uh, but those um, copies of masterpieces, uh, those um, like um, things that, they, that were created in the styles of great masters, uh, they still speak a lot about uh, the whole history of the Chinese uh, painting. And uh, Thais Jaspar herself, she was, uh, a, a painter, and here in the picture you see her you know, by her work uh, depicting the horrors of war, uh, the horrors of uh, uh, Japanese uh, occupation of China, 
and uh, she was uh, uh, like uh, very, um, I would say, uh, she was very aware of the moment of the politics of uh, uh, like the, the context. And her collection is like uh, such, a, such a thing that would play in any other context we, we would give it. So uh, she lived in her reality. We live in all of our reality. And uh, what we have now is on one hand is inseparable from uh, the personalities of people who collected the collection. Uh, but on the other hand, it's like um, a very universal thing. Uh, the thing behind any time and place uh, restrictions. And so uh, we are happy to have this collection in our museum and uh, to just to show you quite a f uh, just a few things here. Uh, so um, to say this uh, uh, picture of uh, Guan Yu of uh, uh, general of the uh, Three Kingdoms period. Um, he, uh, uh, the, uh, the historical character who became almost um, like, um, yeah, he was depicted as uh, an absolutely superhuman and uh, became a kind of a, a god and bodhisattva in any kind of uh, uh, Taoist or Buddhist uh, understanding of uh, religion uh, in China. Uh, so this uh, picture was attributed to like some old masters, uh, but now we, uh, we see, <laughs> it, it, it isn't like the first attribution was uh, the uh, 12th century or like. And it was given uh, along with the uh, notes following the collection. So uh, the, the picture was, uh, the, the painting was uh, bought by the museum as such of a Song dynasty. Uh, but still it's a very nice uh, uh, artwork and um, there is a, a almost like a twin painting of uh, Guan Yi uh, in the uh, museum of uh, Wuhan city. And it is attributed as Qing dynasty. So from the late, uh, like the second half of the 17th century to early 20th century. Uh, and still we, so we see this, um, uh, th th that's a big, actually a big uh, scroll. Uh, and uh, it has such a uh, like monumental uh, trait to the, the hero's um, uh, appearance. So uh, it's, it's a really, really quality painting. And no matter how it was attributed uh, before, no matter how it came to the Museum of Kiev, um, Right, to, to, to the Soviet, former Soviet Union and to the to, to our city, still it's like it's a masterpiece. So I'm happy to have it in our collection. Mm, so there were not only heroes, and uh, uh, there are lots of uh, paintings of uh, uh, beauties, as the Chinese call this genre of. Uh, portraits of court ladies and later the uh, female god, uh, gods, deities, and um, some heroes also. Uh, so uh, these uh, artworks, um, they still need uh, restoration. Uh, they were exhibited a few years ago. And uh, like I expect, uh, us to find the, the founding, uh, fundings uh, to, to restore them all, and uh, also the facilities to show them all, and uh, not in short exhibitions, but uh, like uh, during uh, long, longer periods, as, uh, periods as long as uh, it is safe for the paintings like that. Uh, there are uh, like of, uh, 300 and more pieces, there are 100 uh, plus 
paintings of birds and flowers. Um, and also lots of them were attributed to uh, lots of uh, famous artists. And the analysis, future analysis had shown that uh, those were not the, uh, the uh, real authors, those were much later artworks. Uh, this could not be uh, like this one could not be uh, Ming Dynasty from like uh, 14th to the 17th century. But nevertheless, uh, the quality of painting um, uh, is very, very unique. It's very impressive. Uh, so um, uh, that, that's all. Uh, they, these all are valuable. Uh, these are valuable for like <laughs> anyone everywhere who understands, uh, who, 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 or who wants to understand the Chinese art and to learn more about it. Uh, eventually, um, there are some uh, originals. Uh, not everything in that collection was uh, were, were like copies and imitations. Uh, and some uh, pieces were by, um, created by the uh, contemporaries of the Jasper couple, and there were like these crabs. Uh, though, uh, there is um, an inscription uh, on the back side of the painting uh, from a certain lady who had given this picture of Chen Shuzhen, uh, the famous painter uh, of uh, Sichuan school. So uh, she presents this to Mrs. Jasper. And perhaps uh, I have to, uh, I had to elaborate more on the um, uh, Chinese uh, porcelain uh, here. Uh, like uh, there were some, uh, uh, some also some porcelain uh, uh, pieces uh, in the Jasper collection, but, but not really much. And uh, still they are uh, valuable pieces from Qing dynasty. And um, I, I'm sorry, but I'm not an expert in that. And uh, perhaps um, if, you, uh, if you are interested, perhaps uh, I may ask uh, one of my colleagues who is currently in Kyiv uh, to give a talk because that's uh, her fo uh, the focus of her uh, actually, um, her PhD thesis, and that's the focus of all her work in our museum. Uh, there's also another colleague who deals with uh, bronzes, uh, who uh, researches on bronzes. Uh, and uh, when, uh, uh, like, uh, perhaps if you are if you are more interested in uh, like decorative arts, uh, um, so I can. Um, transfer yeah and, and you have a, if you have questions or if you have more interest interest in these things uh, I can transfer uh, you to these colleagues and now I get back to what to the things uh, I personally research uh, and I'm interested in so these are uh, Chinese folk woodblock prints uh, that have never been uh, on a regular display in our museum, but we show them from time to time, uh, mostly on uh, uh, in exhibitions uh, for before the Chinese New Year, the Chunzi, and uh, these uh, came to our museum from different sources. Some of them are lost, uh, so we cannot really trace back. Uh, uh, when, when well, were those uh, things acquired and how did they came to our museum, uh, who were the previous owners, owners and like. Uh, but these things are really rare now because they were intended to be, uh, to be used only for a year. Uh, uh, contrary to the uh, paintings that were an elite thing and uh, that were uh, transferred from generation to generation, kept as a family treasure. Uh, these woodblock prints, they survived only one year and were removed and burned uh, as a part of a ritual, or as a part of a superstition. Uh, so uh, they um, uh, actually um, came to the museum uh, as uh, like um, just uh, 
not the artworks, but some ethnographical uh, pieces, uh, ethnographical uh, items, uh, like um, something uh, complementary and secondary, uh, but still they deserve lots of interest. And I assume from the uh, inscription here that uh, uh, that must be uh, created for uh, 1906, uh, the year of a red horse. Uh, but um, I would need more, uh, like more, more data to compare, more to learn about the uh, masters who created these uh, fo uh, folkloric woodblock prints. Uh, so uh, I can state it clearly that, that uh, that's early. 20th century and not the middle uh, 20th century. Uh, and um, also, so you can see there are lots of these pictures. Uh, uh, some of them uh, represent the life that the uh, poor people expected to live. Uh, uh, some are uh, quite strange uh, pictures, uh, but still they are loaded with plenty of meanings. Uh, they, these are well-wishing pictures, uh, so anybody would understand uh, that uh, this uh, fish and the kids' uh, uh, hands uh, would represent uh, wealth and abundance, and the uh, calico cat is uh, a symbol of longevity, so uh, it's like uh, the, these compositions, they are like... Uh, uh, puzzles to decode and uh, to understand the uh, the uh, good wishes behind uh, these uh, like uh, quite bold, uh, quite expressive uh, images. And when we talk about the museum as a whole, and um, uh, like uh, we, I've uh, told you that. Uh, the library of the museum was supposed to be also uh, open to public, uh, accessible to, uh, by public, and um, uh, it, the, the museum founders supposed it to be uh, kept in all in one building, all in one collection. It didn't happen, but still uh, we even got uh, more of rare uh, prints, rare books, uh, from different sources, and uh, this is a block, woodblock print uh, of uh, the illustrations uh, for the famous uh, Chinese uh, uh, novel, uh, the, the Water Imagine, so you may know the name, uh, uh, All Men Are Brothers, uh, in Russian that's Richnia Zavadi. Uh, so uh, the reprints were made from the original wood blocks uh, in uh, in Beijing in 1970 uh, in 1957. Uh, so uh, these books are still kept in our uh, museum in our museum library. So <laughs> we can even borrow them. And uh, to um, finish my talk today and I'm, I'll be glad to hear your questions. Perhaps um, I've been trying to tell lots of stories in what, in what short period of time and uh, that could be like uh, mosaics and we, we definitely need to go back to some instances. Uh, but uh, here um, what I would like to show you is uh, the picture of uh, the Confucius uh, uh, Institute uh, event in uh, Ukraine. And uh, that was in March uh, 2014, uh, when we had an exhibition of a contemporary calligrapher, Mark Wojun. And uh, we also um, held a masterclasses on Chinese uh, calligraphy every day there. Uh, so uh, we had um, really big support from the, on the part of the uh, Confucius Institute. Uh, uh, like uh, uh, when I just uh, said, like uh, 
Uh, an exhibition uh, of calligraphy is a good thing, but uh, our people want to uh, try lots of things in themselves. So they they uh, like uh, hands-on activities. They organize those master classes right away. Uh, uh, the person on the left uh, in black it was the calligrapher, the student of uh, our Acad academy of arts, uh, foreign student. Um, there are lots of Chinese students there. And um, he was uh, a very, he, he was a young person, but he was very patient, very uh, kind and um, like um, very charming with all our guests, uh, with our audience, and uh, it was a great success. Uh, so the, as you see, the museum um, continues living uh, its life even now. Uh, we are having some online events. We're having some, we, we try to represent ourselves uh, on social media. And we hope to get back to our audience to put everything back uh, to the halls and to all reopen to public as soon as uh, we, Ukraine wins and there is no martial law and there are no sirens anymore. So uh, hopefully we'll have more exhibitions, we'll have more uh, interesting collaborations with journalists, uh, with archive workers, with artists. And that's my, my wish, my dream. And uh, so now please type or ask your questions. Uh, thank you, Marta, for the presentation. Um, we also hope that like, in the very near future, we'll be able to go and visit your museum and um, uh, admire the masterpieces um, on spot. So thank you. So thank you. Any questions? I, I want, uh, I have a question. Uh, which uh, a piece of art of Chinese painting is the most valuable? How do you think? Oh, so I would uh, say that these two pieces acquired by Hanyan Kakapu are the most valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So um, these are, um, there was uh, quite a a lot of research done, particularly uh, on these two pieces. So they attract attention uh, as those <laughs> that used to belong to the museum founders. And they are originals. Um, well, talking about prices, uh, the Mongolian with a horse was bought for like 3,500 French francs. And uh, the pen is on a rock uh, where like uh, 1,500 uh, francs by, <laughs> in 1914. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, those were, uh, were really valued items uh, for the French collectors who decided to part with them for some reason, but still uh, they did, didn't want to give that cheap. And, and later on, uh, like we had um, Alina Martinianova and Professor uh, Thomas, uh, 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 I'm sorry, I've forgotten the, the, uh, the, his last name. Uh, so the professor from Zurich University and his assistant Alina Martinianova visited us in uh, 2016 and uh, they've done lots of research on these two items, mostly on the actually on, on the peonies on the rock. And luckily there is an inscription so we can attribute uh, that to uh, uh, not so famous. Uh, so these, uh, these are the most valuable. <laughs> Mm 